Carlene, that was a very interesting hour. Coming from the deck side, it, uh, it kind of opened my eyes. I always thought the engineering side was a black box. But within that black box, there's a lot of things going on. So I appreciate the, the commentary from Dr. Viss and his uh, excellent panel. We're going to be talking about energy alternatives. And Sergio Garcia, DMV, is our host. Somehow struggling with my video, but I think I'll uh, start. We have, uh, I believe, all of other, uh, our panelists uh, already in. So good morning. And uh, on these virtual times also can be good afternoon or good evening, depending from where in the world right. you're joining us. Welcome to Shipping Insight 2020, Vision for the Decade. This is our deep dive on alternative fuels or alternative energy. My name is Sergio Garcia. I'm the uh, head of communications uh, for DNVGL Maritime. DNVGL is a proud host and I'm delighted to be the moderator for this panel. We do have uh, seven distinguished speakers uh, whom I'll introduce before each one will be addressing some of the alternatives. But first, on behalf of all the panelists, I would like to thank and congratulate the Shipping Insight team for bringing these events to a virtual platform this year due to the pandemic restrictions. It is important for the industry to have this opportunity to debate the topics of interest. Uh, we wish all in attendance uh, are healthy and stay safe. The structure of this session uh, will be a short opening overview from my side, followed by each presentation, then a live poll and close to the end, ran by the organization, and then a Q&A. So for the, those in attendance, uh, please uh, post your questions on the chat function. It is a tight schedule. I have asked the speakers uh, to convey their message uh, within the allocated time, and I'll remind them about that. We uh, also have the pleasure of having Eric Nagel, mm -hmm. the director of Atlantic Aframax and Global Support Services for TK Tankers as an, our anchor. So the aim is for, for the anchor is to be this uh, sounding board from an operations perspective enough. on the various alternatives presented today. So I'll uh -huh. ask Eric's input at the end of each topic. So for my introduction, I think it's important for us to be on the same page. Why are we talking about alternative fuels or alternative energy in large scale? And what do we mean by alternative fuels in this context? Last year, the industry has focused on January 1st, 2020, so for cap. Now the attention goes to the IMO strategy on reduction of greenhouse gases with some related milestones requirements by 2023, by 2030, by 2050, and aiming at zero emissions as soon as possible within this century. We know that greenhouse gases can be reduced with less fuel consumption by operational efficiency like technical means, logistic optimization, etc. However, all with limited emission reductions, which will help for short term goals, but only replacing fuel oil as we know today will effectively lead the industry to reach the IMO goals. Therefore, we all need to continue working together to develop and apply alternative fuels to ships. There is no silver bullet, no one size fits all, but there are alternative fuels which will allow for a flexible transition and allowing for the ships to uh, last longer and be economically viable. Despite some of uh, these milestones being by 2030, 2050, which by some people may be seem distant, we as an industry have a long way to go. According to the NVGL 2020 edition of the Maritime Forecast to 2050, just launched a few weeks ago, less than 1% of the existing fleet is running out on alternative fuels, and that's mainly batteries on ferries, offshore support vessels, short sea shipping, and LNG. And less than 6% of the order book has alternative uh, fuel systems, including now LPG, methanol, ammonia, and others. So we are facing a grand challenge. With that said, let's deep dive. 
Our first presenter is uh, Rear Admiral Kevin Cook, Executive Advisor, GTT North America, and he will guide us on, on uh, LNG fuel. Admiral Cook, the, the screen is yours. Great, Sergio. Thank you very much. And I, I, don't, I don't know if the slide presenters can go ahead and bring up my slides, please. Well, while they're um, pulling up the slides, let me just go ahead and do a little bit of an introduction. For those of you who, who may have known me in my Coast Guard career, uh, you know that my focus has been the, the transportation of hazardous materials safely, securely, environmentally sound throughout the globe. A lot of IMO work, a lot of US regulations, a lot of time on the US Gulf. So when the opportunity to go with GTT as an executive advisor came along, uh, it was a, a natural jump for me. Uh, they opened up a Houston office. Uh, they're a French company, so this was a, a big step to open the Houston office, and, and it's to focus on LNG as fuel. So what I'll try and do is give you the best picture I can of uh, LNG as fuel and the, the growing infrastructure and uh, kind of a general worldwide picture. By way of introduction, GTT is traded uh, publicly on the, the Paris Exchange. And they are really the global leader in LNG containment technology. So, uh, but they are used quite extensively in LNG carriers. Today, we're just gonna focus on LNG as fuel. I have a, more than a handful of slides that I wanna go through that hopefully we'll see here soon um, to, to go ahead and uh, give you the journey, a little uh, emphasis on the journey of LNG as fuel so that uh, behind me, Steve Hadley can can John Hadley can uh, go ahead and give you a better picture of uh, some of the most recent uh, elements. So um, let, me, let me just ask you, Sergio, are you seeing the slides? Yes. Oh, you are, great, because it's not showing on mine. So I would ask that we go to the third slide. And there we see that the, it's really the environmental performance of LNG stacked up against HFO, HFO with the scrubber and low sulfur fuel. And you can see that across the board, uh, LNG has, has a really good performance. Uh, so in the past, SOX and NOx and particulates were the focus. Now, we're also looking quite a bit at CO2. And you can see that the, it provides a 25% reduction there. And there's also a lot of ongoing work with bio LNG and synthetic LNG that will continue to see that percentage grow as those are woven into the, the infrastructure. And uh, some people even envision a future where LNG is not only a transitional fuel, but is a pathway to zero carbon. Next slide, please. I always like to show uh, this, this slide just to, um, for people that cho choose an environmentally compliant method. Uh, sometimes there's unintended consequences. In this case, these are areas that have special uh, concerns for open loop scrubbers, and it makes it an operational nightmare for companies trying to comply. Whereas if we're able to go to a, a fuel like LNG, which provides that uh, level of, of uh, reduction in sulfur. Mm -hmm. It also opens up the door for many other um, ease of operations. So the, uh, the next slide, please. And that, will, that is the uh, IMO timeline. And um, that's really the driver behind this new look at CO2. So the first couple of years on the timeline there, um, 2022, 2025, that's where rules are going to come into play for existing ships such that uh, they're going to make some reductions to help beat the first concrete goal which is a 40 percent reduction in carbon intensity by 2030. Then of course there'll be more new ships built, tighter standards, and more alternative fuels brought in and to reach the IMO goal of 50 percent reduction of CO2 by 2050. So that's going to be a driving force. And in fact, uh, later this month, the IMO Greenhouse Gas Reduction Work Group will be meeting in virtual session uh, for the first time this year. But uh, they've been working hard in the background and, and looking very uh, strongly at short-term measures, which will affect existing ships before 2025. Next slide, please. This is just a very quick overview uh, to give you a picture of new uh, LNG fueled ships, as well as those that are on order. Uh, if you add those two up, it's about 400 ships that are gonna be outfitted here soon with the uh, LNGS fuel. And if you work your way from left to right, 
again, I'll just go fast because I want to cover this slide picture, but uh, you, you've got ferries, oil tankers, you've got container ships right there in the middle, and that is a really growing segment right now. I think next year, if we come back, that may be the leading segment, then all the way to the right, cruise ships. So there's the, the quite a bit of activity, and I know what John will highlight some of that for us too. Next slide, please. Just another way of looking at the same expected uh, growth. This is from Potent Partners over the next 10 years. They're expecting something like 3,000 new LNG fueled ships to be added to the fleet. Um, the two bar graphs are their, their lower case of uh, 2,500, their upper case of 3,400, but essentially those same uh, ship types are uh, emphasized again that we talked about in the last bar graphs. Next slide. And next slide. So this is just going to give you a very quick walk through the infrastructure as it continues to develop. So you see uh, Europe is quite dense at the point, this point over on the left. Uh, where there's crowns, there's actually LNG vessels available. Where there's a, a big capital L's, those are locations where LNG is available from the shore side, either to load bunker vessels or sometimes directly load to ships if the dock is suitable. So you'll see that um, for Europe in uh, the Far East. Then you, if we can go to the next slide, I'll give you kind of a, another quick sampling, uh, the Americas, the Middle East, and Southern Asia. The point being that the infrastructure is there and just continues to grow. Next slide. This is a, a quick snapshot of where all the bunker vessels are. So if they're, if the uh, description of the name in the, is uh, in black, then it's one that's currently in service. If it's in red, um, it'll be, either be coming into service later this year or is under construction. Uh, but there, there are a fair number uh, and it's really uh, multiplying. And I think that we've seen a lot of vessels in the under 5,000 cubic meter range, um, but we're starting to see a growing number get above that as uh, particular projects come to fruition and they need more and more LNG to provide the kind of autonomy that owners are looking for. Uh, next slide. And then, so we've got the infrastructure. Uh, I just want to, and one more slide, please. I just want to just give you quick highlights um, from the GTT order book. So just one comment before that, um, you see a number of ships, maybe put a deck tank of, uh, on board for LNG, it may be a thousand cubic meters, maybe 1500. But the GTT tanks are particularly well suited for larger quantities. And you'll see some of the, um, the ships that are really looking for longer legs going to using the GTT technology. But regardless, it's interesting just to see the types of ships that are now coming on the market. Next slide. Yeah, Admiral, can you please uh, conclude this uh, CP, please? Yep. So the are a uh, series of five, um, ULCSs that are ultra large container ships with a 14,000 cubic meter fuel tank. Uh, next down is a half ag Lloyd ship, the Shair. It's having a 6,700 cubic meter fuel tank loaded into it. And you notice it has a ship shape already to maximize the volume of fuel and minimize the impact of cargo. So this is a first of its kind and potentially a game changer. The bottom slide is the Jacques Saad. That uh, is the newest ship from CMA CGM. 22,000 TEU container ship, if you're familiar with that terminology, ninth, almost 19,000 cubic meter fuel tank. That ship is designed to go from Rotterdam to the Far East and back to Rotterdam before refueling. Next slide. Uh, just three more examples. Uh, French <clears throat> cruise line, Penant, has ordered an expeditionary, expeditionary cruise ship uh, where they needed to maximize the volume of their LNG. It's being built at Vard, Norway now and that ship will go to the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, MOL uh, built the um, bunker ships that are compatible with the large CMA CGM ship I just mentioned. That's the very first one delivered, now operating in Rotterdam, uh, just about 19,000 cubic meter capacity. And finally, MOL has a, a, a bunker vessel being built at Semcorp in, uh, and it's gonna service Singapore, 12,000 cubic meters. So that'll, that'll be out soon. And I think with that, it just really, my point is LNG is a viable fuel now. It has potential in the future for further reductions with synthetic and biofuel. 
and also the number of ships and the interesting um, arrangement of ships and bunker ships are all filling out faster than we can really keep track of. So with that, I look forward to John picking up and uh, finishing the LNG story. Thank you, Rear Admiral. Uh, yes, our next speaker is John Hartley, America's VP of Marine Solutions and Director of Market Shaping at Wartzilla, also to uh, guide us uh, on LNG as fuel. Please, John. Thank you very much. Is my uh, speaker on okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, and the uh, title of today, and I thank the Admiral for the introduction here, is that there is a major move uh, towards te uh, the technology acceptance of LNG as a great transitioning fuel into the future. So I, I'm going to present today a business case where we compare, compare the two alternatives of LNG fuel versus a more traditional high sulfur fuel oil with scrubber alternative, in particular in alignment with the Poseidon principal loans. Next slide, please. So the basic end summary is that, and we'll come back to this, that the LNG fuel ship extends the CO2 compliance runway seven plus years into the beneficial low interest rate Poseidon principal loans. And these loans are established to help support the IMO greenhouse gas ambitions, all leading to a cleaner planet. Next slide, please. So the case is, for example, here we have a 210,000 dead weight ton cape size. The challenge is what does the LNG provide against the alternative high sulfur fuel and scrubber. And the focus here will be on the compliance years within the beneficial Poseidon principal loan cover. It's all green ships being driven by the IMO mandates and ambitions to clean up our, our planet. So we have a new build entering into service 2022. Next slide, please. The run that we chose was the traditional run for many bulk carriers from Australia to China. And let's dive straight into the Poseidon principles. June of 2019, they came into effect. This is the first full year of review where the banks will be submitting in November next month, the scores across the portfolio of their ship loans. Today, there's 150 billion, that's with a B, US dollars in this loan portfolio amongst 15 major banks and leasing groups and is to provide responsible finance to meet these uh, IMO ambitions. And the funds are typically provided under a form of sustainability linked loans keyed on tracking the AER metric. Next slide, please. This is a direct pull out from the Poseidon principles catalog where they describe the AER, the average efficiency ratio. You can see it circled in orange. The numerator is the total sum of fuel over the year times each fuel weighted carbon intensity value. And there's a key outcome to this because you can see the denominator has the dead weight times the distance. It's a measure of transport work. The outcome is that that AER score for each ship should track well below the IMO guidance value. And this would provide then the vessel remaining within the fold. If it's teetering on the edge, it's a question mark. And if it falls out, perhaps it might lose its Poseidon principal loan privilege of low interest rates. Next slide, please. On the right, you will see again a pull out from the Poseidon principles chart. The bottom scale is years, the vertical scale is carbon intensity, and that blue line has been shaded by me so the observers here can see it's a downward trend from 2012, upper left, to lower right, 2050. There are financial consequences. The man pictured here is Hugo de Stoop. For those who don't know him, he's the CEO of Euronav, who has a fleet of several dozen tankers consisting principally of VLCCs and Suez Maxes. Last week, he said at a virtual conference, remarks relating to when a ship falls out of compliance, and he said, quote, it's not a question of obtaining refinancing at a price, 
meaning higher interest rate, quote, it's really a question of can one find refinancing, yay or nay? Next slide, please. So the culprit we see is the fuel that's been burned and the carbon generated. On the left, we have weak markets. On the, on the right, we have normal markets. The orange you can see is the MG, uh, HFO. The blue is LNG, very low sulfur fuel, and a tiny bit of MGO uh, along with the two-stroke engines. Next slide, please. Here's the key takeaway. On the left, we can see for normal markets that the fallout for this ship occurs uh, in its third year of operation 2025 for the scrubber. Again, remember, it's a new ship, 2022, has a 25-year life to 2047. The LNG vessel in the blue dot has a fallout eight years later. And to the right, you can see for the weaker markets with slower speeds, less carbon, little less distance travel, but far less carbon, all these numbers push out. It's still a seven-year advantage. Next slide, please. So what about those ships that are teetering on the edge of falling out of compliance? What may they do to try to get back into the fold of the good greener ships in the Poseidon group? There's really two choices. The first path is zero cap expenditure now and accept speed reductions sufficient to resume loan compliance with your AER calculated value. But this is going to mean lower charter rates and reduced utilization. Why? Because the charter is going to say, I need this speed, A to B, safely move my cargo on time. And if your ship can't offer that speed due to AER concerns, your offer will be maybe rejected. He'll pick a faster ship. So you'll sit back and your utilization goes down and you'll sit back and tell a lower charter, higher rate is offered for the slower speed. The second option Path two is you can spend some CapEx prior to falling out for efficiency upgrades. And these will give you a buffer to help move your ship and extend that runway of Poseidon compliance. You only suffer competitive dislocation. Next slide, please. So you can see that the LNG fuel extends the CO2 compliance across all markets as we started seven or more years, weak, normal, and strong. And it's a changing landscape. Next slide, please. Let's take a quick look at some news. Next slide. In January, International Seaways obtained a $340 million loan linked to Poseidon principles. And on the right, you can see the company's announcement. They're saving $15 million a year in interest each and every year. That's a million three a month the January announcement from Lois Zabrotsky. Next slide, please. John, if you may uh, close. I have one Next slide step. and that's it. And we're done, sir. I, I think I'm on time. Next slide, the last slide. We don't have a last slide. Anyway, Lois was still talking about this uh, last week at the same virtual conference with Hugo de Stoop that they have now a AER value that's promoted to their stockholders quarterly and they're proud of B and remaining within the AER scores for Poseidon Principal Compliance. That's it. Thank you very much, John. Eric, I'd like to bring you up. Uh, we heard uh, about LNG as a few from the, from the logistics side and also from the uh, incentives on finance uh, through the Poseidon Principal, which is a key element on the greenhouse gases reduction. So your summary views on LNG as few, please. Uh, my summer reviews on LNG. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sergio. The um, it's it's very encouraging to see uh, Admiral Cook's uh, slides that suggest that the we we are seeing um, the infrastructure uh, for LNG continuing to develop, uh, predominantly in Europe and Asia. Um, the United States. It's interesting. It, it's you know I I see these platforms and. You know, working in the U.S., I, you know, we, we all know that we have an abundance of, of LNG as a resource. Um, and it's been interesting to see that that develop uh, perhaps a little bit slower. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged to see see the future. Um, putting my own personal view on it, um, I, I can think back to 2012 working on a shipbuilding project um, where we looked at the potential with a customer to implement L LNG technology. The biggest concern was that the infrastructure wasn't 
quite there yet, and it was a bit of a chicken and egg. So very encouraged to see that. Um, you know, with regards to the Poseidon principle um, uh, that uh, John has has uh, spoke about today, I think th this is the forefront of of all ship owners' minds right now, um, looking into the future. Uh, I know the company that I work for at TK. Um, we 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 recognize that you know our sustainability is 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 a primary focus point right now as we move towards 2030 and further into the future. Um, my my express view would be that um, the Poseidon principle is going to encourage owners um, to to move towards the the, the greener technology. Um, LNG seems to be a readily available solution, one that one that is 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 fit. Um, I think you know the interesting um, uh, slide that John had was the you know the the alternatives to um, uh, either slow steam and reduce your rate versus invest capex. Um, really, I think what what this says to me is that um, there is going to be a lot of pressure on the current world fleet uh, in all segments to 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 potentially look at um, uh, fleet renewal. Um, in, you know, speaking specifically for the conventional oil tanker trade, um, you know, the, the challenge that we have as an industry is, is getting that return on investment, uh, for investing CapEx on, on ships, particularly, uh, coming up on their second special survey, um, and, and the runway that you would get for that investment in LNG technology. Um, but, but certainly, um, LNG seems to be a, a proven technology that moves us forward in a positive meaning. Um, and uh, gentlemen, I, I appreciate your, uh, your, your presentations today. Thank you for your insights as well, Eric. So we will move to the next speaker, uh, John Eltringham, uh, Project Director uh, at Schulte Group, uh, who will uh, guide us uh, through the use of hydrogen and ammonia. John, the mic Good morning, is yours. everyone. Can you see the presentation? Thank you. Um, just a quick introduction of Schulte, slide two, please. A German fifth generation family owned company, approximately 900, uh, 90 ships, owned in 600 ships under management. We're also a global marine service provider, as shown. Slide three, please. <clears throat> a year ago, Schulte set up a scenario strategy initiative and formed working groups from all sectors of the business to look at artificial intelligence, autonomy, and decarbonization. I'm a part of the GCARB team and here to talk about hydrogen and ammonia. Now, straight away, I'm going to say, I'm not a chemist or an engine designer, so this is a bit of an update from a ship owner's point of view only. We were only months into the investigation phase when senior management came and asked, OK, John, if we order a new ship now and has to be future-proof and able to operate for the next 25 to 30 years, and by the way, we want to be zero carbon emission by then, what technology do we go for? Simple question, but wow, that's what ship owners with a difficult job of fleet renewal want to know. Believe it or not, the high-level answer is also fairly simple as I'll explain later, but first some assumptions. Number one, slide four, please. The less you burn, the less you emit. It's taken that ship owners' charters will order ships with the best EDI rating and probably add a few bells and whistles, as mentioned in the earlier session, to squeeze the last efficiency percentage out of that optimized hull design. For example, air lubrication and maybe a flow improvement duct or something similar down there. Assumption two, slide five, please. There are many advancing technologies out there, including DC power systems, more use of shaft generators, batteries, fuel cells, even sails, etc. And they will be and they will all play their part in improving the efficiency of onboard power management. But what about the prime mover? When we started our investigation, I didn't know if the internal combustion engine would have survive and go the same way as the car industry. That particular battle has been lost. But in the marine industry, we are not even going to have that battle. The internal combustion engine, which includes gas turbines, is the only technology foreseeable other than nuclear that can produce the power required up to 100,000 brake horsepower plus. And after 100 years of development, it's superb and will be around as modification for way past 2050. But when you think about it, it's not the engine causing the pollution, but the fuel. Next issue, hydrogen and ammonia. Slide six, please. They both, they both get lots of mixed press, but when you look at the combustion process, pure car carbon doesn't burn by itself. So going all the way back to wood, coal, oil, and methane, it's the hydrogen that's burning and has been since man discovered fire. So to try and burn it in its purest form without that carbon as a carrier is a natural progression. 
They understand the problem of energy, energy density and containment, but that's another discussion. But the biggest problem is its flammability. I'm from the LNG as fuel business, and we talk about methane number. As you know, it's resistance to knocking, pre-ignition, and the higher the number, the better the resistance. Pure methane is 100, but pure hydrogen is zero. So herein lies the problem. But that has been addressed by the engine builders. One solution, possibly co-firing H2 in a lean burn engine up to a maximum content, say 20%, then converting to direct injection for 100. It's all about ignition control and combustion geometry. To get around the storage problem of hydrogen, can we use a carbon-free carrier? And yes, presently the front runner, that much discussed, love it or hate it, ammonia. NH3 burns cleanly with only nitrogen water as an emission. But unfortunately, unlike hydrogen, it has an opposite characteristic. It doesn't really like to burn at all. Engine builders are also addressing that. And it's presently considered that a commercial ammonia burning engine will be available in about three years' time. Because of the slow flame front, it seems more suited to the slow speed two-stroke engine. On these long stroke engines, though the piston speed is approaching supersonic at mid-stroke, at top dead center, it's slow. So basically provides more time for good combustion as opposed to the higher speed four stroke. Ammonia, however, is also being addressed by proponents of that technology, maybe using pre-combustion fuel mixing. For both four stroke and two stroke application, a pilot fuel will be required. That raises the issue of loading in substantial quantities two different types of carbon-free fuel. Could that be an ammonia and some hydrogen, or could we just load a single fuel and reform a pilot fuel from it? Who knows? Whatever the solution, the primary fuels of hydrogen and ammonia in bulk follow different technology paths. And this is the key to answering that first question. What do we do now? Ammonia is commonly transported very successfully at sea at up to 18 bar and ambient temperature down to minus 30. But as we, as we know, it is both toxic and corrosive to certain metals, including copper, brass, zinc, etc. Hydrogen has its own challenges, explosive and with a liquid storage temperature down to minus 252 degrees C. So the safety case for both is going to be interesting. But it will be solved, as it was for LNG and other low flash point fuels, and it might even require some level of autonomy on board for the safety of the seafaring. Regardless of that, the two technology paths are cryogenic and non cryogenic. Cost differential, and, uh, sorry, cost differential and suitability in carbon and stainless steels. So here we go to the fourth assumption. Slide seven, please. Green hydrogen produced from renewable sources will be available at some time in the future and in the quantities required at the right price. And hence green ammonia will also be available. If we take in then, if we take then that both hydrogen and ammonia will be available as a destination fuel for decarbonization, but we don't know when, then what transitional fuel can the ship owner, charter, get their hands on now? And that will lead to the future-proof design. That transitional fuel could be LNG, and you're on the path to burning hydrogen, or it could be LPG, methanol, or biofuel, and you're on the path to ammonia. It will be up to you, or up to what type of ship you have, its trade, voyage profile, and availability as the choice of that fuel. Slide eight, please. In conclusion, a ship ordered now will probably have to change fuel type in its life. And that path to decarbonization should be thought about at the design stage, taking into account the transitional fuel it will burn upon delivery. Think early about the metallurgy and of course a footprint for doubling the size and more of the initial bunker capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your views here. Um, Interesting that uh, on DNVGL uh, latest uh, uh, maritime forecast to 2050, we also highlight uh, this uh, transition fuel and the use of uh, ammonia and methanol as uh, two of the possibilities growing. Just uh, uh, one other topic uh, to uh, remember, uh, John also mentioned the technology being in, in, in development. Uh, Remember that uh, LNG as a few started 20 years ago, the batteries started 10 years ago, and the, 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 the speed of technology development is increasing, of course. So, Eric, what's your take on, on uh, ammonia hydrogen uh, moving forward? Yes, Sergio, thank you. Um, I, I, it, John, I thank you very much for, for your presentation and uh, Schulte's uh, work on uh, on 
hydrogen uh, and the ammonium fuels. I, I think that this is a really interesting space um, for ship owners. You know, speaking from the conventional uh, oil tanker uh, side of the table, I, I would say it'd be transformational uh, for, for us as an industry uh, in the oil tanker trade because perhaps it really changes the landscape of what, what cargo are we uh, tasked with moving around the world. Um, and uh, I think it's a very exciting future. I think there's a lot of a lot of hurdles that you've 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 summarized very, uh, very well. Uh, particularly for me, uh, where where I've I've got a lot of lot to learn uh, and become more educated. But uh, to me, I, I think that this this is an interesting um, interesting development uh, for our future um, around hydrogen fuel. Um, but I, I think it, it it requires a coalition of the industry to come together and share share their knowledge and um and and collaborate uh and develop the technology if, if it's to to happen quickly uh because there's also equally a, a lot of questions around uh infrastructure and and support but um really really enjoyed uh, your presentation and thank you for the education today thank you eric so our next speaker is brent perry ceo of sterling pbs who will give us an overview on batteries uh, application Hi, everybody. I'm going to probably approach this a little differently, having heard the first presentations. I think I can be a little more uh, value add to everybody if I change up my order a little bit. So if I can go to slide number two uh, to start with. So just to give you a sense of our perspective and where we bring input into this kind of a forum, I've been uh, involved in bringing en energy storage systems into the marine space since, since in practical terms since about 2010 and have seen about 240 installations of hybrid and electric applications globally in that period of time. So we've gained a bit of perspective. If I could go to slide number four, please. So in, in summary, uh, in terms of energy storage in general, there's been a lot of technology advancements, but fundamentally it's, uh, it's really been come down to the terms of how does it add value to marine applications. So charging time has been instrumental and we've now gotten the charging time of a battery system down into the four, five, six minute range to bring it back up to a full operational capability, which means there's very little impact uh, to it, but also puts a challenge on the infrastructure to deliver that much energy to a ship in that period of time. Uh, we've seen system sizes decrease uh, significantly over the next last 10 years energy density has increased, energy capacity has in increased, and the cycle life of the battery systems has increased drastically in the last 10 years. We're, to give you a sense of scope, that's about seven times more cycles than we would have achieved back in 2010 with a very similar base technology, if you wish. If I can go to slide number three, please. So this is just a picture of a, of a rough concept of a system. Almost every energy storage system in the world has similar architecture and that the cells which prevent are the, the muscle, if you want, of a lithium battery, the modules which make up the elements and we scale these up and down to develop the voltage DC range that is suitable for the ships that we work in partnership with. And then you have uh, either an internal battery room similar to this where you've incorporated your safety your ventilation, your fire management, your integration into the ship's grid, and if you have, in our, as in our case, liquid cooling, uh, liquid cooling system. So that's one way of installing batteries internally to a vessel. And if we can go to slide number six. And then the second way, which is becoming much more, uh, I think, relatively speaking, cost effective is fully containerized system that, that are either uh, all battery. In this case, now we're able to achieve about 2.2 megawatt hour in a 20 foot high cube container, uh, or we have these and many people are offering these effectively as turnkey, turnkey microgrids. So all of the AC conversion in order for this to be a plug and play system on board a ship. So it literally can plug in or it can be hardwired in and located anywhere within the vessel uh, to suit the needs of the specific type of vessel that we're going. Those are pretty much the two variables we have in terms of installation options today. And if I can go to slide number 10, please. So given all of that, 
it, we kind of get down to the crux of the entire message here. The, oh, actually, sorry, can you go back to slide number seven? My mistake. Thank you. Uh, and, and what does ESS do? And unlike everybody else that we're dealing with in today's presentation, I would tell you in most cases, uh, when we're talking blue water boats, we're not talking fully electric operational capability. That's just not relatively intelligent enough. The, the battery ship would have to be bigger than the vessel that's actually making the, the transport of the goods. So what batteries are effectively is a time machine. We have a specific amount of contained energy. And one of the unique features of batteries is that they can charge and discharge in different ratings of time. So a, a one megawatt hour battery can discharge five to 10 megawatts of capacity for a specific period of time. And it can take three megawatt or four megawatt in charge, enabling it to get fully status operational within a very short period of time. And when they are charged, they give you a tremendous amount of flexibility. And if you look at all the different fuels that we're discussing today, the key thing that ESS brings to the table is optimization. Because it's not a physical machine that operates on a specific rating management, it is a time machine with stored energy. We can use energy storage where and when it suits the best operating conditions of the different kinds of engines and fuels that we're working with. So diesel's always been a very competitive fuel in terms of managing its capacity and performance. It's got excellent energy density. Um, it's hard to beat. Uh, when you look at things like LNG and ammonia and hydrogen, you know, you face containment, safety, service, support, energy density issues. Um, what energy storage does effectively is allow you to optimize each one of these kind of fuels to get the best kind of performance that you possibly can and contribute to a better bottom line value and a faster payback. And if you want, uh, taking in John's comments, even, an even longer extension of when the ship's propulsion system is gonna become redundant or need to be changed. So what we do is significantly influence the capacity of ap applications to meet rules and regulations or exceed them for a much longer period of time. And you can do this with relatively small capacity energy storage. So we're seeing uh, on, let's say, LNG vessels, for an example, just being able to replace the generator capacity to maintain the pressure and temperature integrity of the tanks uh, has, is a great offshore application while coming in and being a cold ironing source of energy or even a, a import propulsion capacity really adds a lot of elemental performance that you don't do well in any kind of fuel driven application. And the costs of energy at ports are becoming more and more expensive. So the ability to stay independent of these systems is, uh, is going to be something that directly contributes to the bottom line of operation. So can you go to slide number 10, please, Mike? So that brings it down to the reality of this. And CapEx, OpEx is always where the bottom line is. I, I built ships for 30 years. I wouldn't make a purchasing decision that was going to negatively impact my operator's cost of operations because that's not a good way to build repeat business. And what we do with this is we do work in partnership with all of these different types of fuels and integration companies on the power electronics side to really measure where can we best influence the CapEx cost, but more significantly, given the length of time our ships operate, you know, energy systems now are designed to last up to 30 years. Uh, how much money do we make over that period of time and how much reduction in service and resources can we get away with in order to have an operational system? So that really is the sum and the, and the, the value that ESS brings to the table is I can typically uh, marginally improve everything or significantly improve everything while delivering feature performance characteristics that you can't have without bringing a battery into it. So we don't see ourselves as competitors for any of these uh, fuels. We see ourselves as partners. And I think that's how we're all gonna see energy storage being used, especially in blue water applications over the next decades. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, on DNVGL uh, Alternative Fuels Insight platform, which is a public platform, you can uh, uh, have access uh, to several, very, uh, several information about uh, different uh, alternatives. And uh, comparing to what uh, Rear Admiral Kevin showed on LNG application, we also see that batteries, as I said at the beginning, started 
with ferries and then went to offshore support vessels and, and uh, short sea shipping. But it's it's uh, in, increasing the application, as Brent uh, uh, well uh, explained, on also uh, the uh, blue water uh, shipping, not for full electrification, but to assist in reducing the greenhouse gases. So, Eric, what's your take on that? Uh, thank you, Sergio. Uh, I agree with you. Um, it, you know, it, it's it, you know, battery power is something that I think for the for the traditional ma uh, mariner was something that we thought of as uh, as an uh, as an emergency backstop uh, in the event of a, a blackout on a ship at sea, right? And um, and I think that there are. It, it's interesting to hear about the opportunities around uh, changing the view on on. Uh, battery storage uh, of of energy, um, and and coming up with ways on how to how to optimize power usage on board the ship, um, and and I like the approach around working with the the the, the commodities, the the traditional fuel supplies, to figure out what is what is the best solution. Um, I think that you know the the future holds um, where we will see port infrastructure where there's opportunities to um, uh, optimize power usage through battery. Um, and uh, the other the other thing that I do like about this is uh, the, the plug and play concept around uh, battery power. Um, one of th one of the challenges that I see around hydrogen and ammonia obviously is is crewing competency. Um, we, we've got a long way to go um, as an industry as far as um, training our, our seafarers on how to how to manage those fuels efficiently and safely whereas the battery power um it, it offers itself some um, opportunities of uh, plug and play where where effectively you're you're coming into port and you're able to change out that battery pack or you're potentially able to hook up to a shore installation that provides battery-based power um that perhaps the ship is linking in um, I, I think it'll be a really interesting space to see um, further development in the uh, in the uh, container trade um, and potentially the uh, the bulk trade. I think one of the challenges on the conventional oil tanker side would be we, we still have to figure out how to how to keep our, our tanks inert um, efficiently, and that's that's one of the blocks that I've that I've seen and encountered uh, debated um, with colleagues in the industry uh, around you know battery battery power. Thank you, Eric. So we need to speed up. Our next uh, presenter is Alistair Johnson, uh, Desivedo Design TIG Rig, uh, who, who will talk about uh, wind assist. Alistair, please. Hello, How, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, good, okay. Hello, I'm Alistair Johnson. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the International Windship Association, which is an advocacy body for wind powered wind assist commercial shipping. It was formed in 2014. Up to that point, all the designers of wind assist devices were fighting over a non-existent cake. So the decision was made to grow the cake and then get back to fighting, which is where we are now. <laughs> so wind assist is currently only available, a real, only really viable for bulkers and tankers, not container ships at the moment. So there's a target market of 40,000 ships in the world's fleet. By the end of 2020, we'll have 34 ship installations. That's 39,966 to go a market penetration of 0.085%, that's less than one-tenth of 1%. One By the end of 2020, from existing uh, contracts and the pipeline, that'll be 77 to 80, which is doubling to 0.2% penetration. So wind assist is not in its infancy, it's actually embryonic. Next slide, please. There are, here are some of the uh, different forms of wind assist, uh, some of which I'll be detailing later, but you can get all that information from the IWSA website. Next slide, please. Can wind propulsion deliver? Well, it certainly can. Uh, there are all sorts of studies showing how it can, and I'll go into that in more detail now. Next slide, please. So ship owners and operators will tell you that they would kill for 4% savings. Well, retrofit wind assist devices can currently deliver 5 to 10% fuel savings. And the question is, where is the interest? The land lesson. By 2004, wind generated electricity on land cost a fifth of its cost in the 1980s. By 2011, wind electricity cost less than coal. The prediction in 2017 was that by 2030, wind electricity would be 50% cheaper than it was in 2017. And this is all indirect power. Based on the above, wind assist, which is delivering actual 
uh, positive thrust, di direct thrust, will be delivering 10 to 20% more, say, and more savings in direct thrust, and will be able to deliver, also in de uh, able to deliver indirect solar and wind electric. So for these reasons, again, the question is, where is the interest? Next slide, please. Would Oppenheimer or von Braun have passed up the opportunity to get 5% more power? And that is 5% now with the promise of doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling it that, that down the line. Now, they had the benefit of operating within the context of recognized national or international crises and international competition. This meant that there was a huge public will, which made it a no-brainer for political leaders to organize the focused national infrastructure and to encourage collaborative disruption. This meant that uh, Fermi left Chicago, Feynman left Caltech, Chandrasekhar left England, and they all went to Los Alamos and they made the Manhattan Project work. Now, international shipping doesn't have that. It doesn't have the structure, uh, the structure of the industry is not geared to that level of coherence. Uh, and it's in that sense, it's just like the rest of our global industry. There is a, a major problem in organization to get this collaborative disruption to work. Next slide, please. So let's pretend there are 40,000 flat deck ships in the world's merchant fleet uh, with a 30 year average lifespan replacement rate is 1,667 ships per annum. If we, if we had 100% zero emission ships now, we would re, we'd be building them at this rate, no faster, it's not possible, there isn't the capacity. If they cost the same as regular ships at about $60 million a pop, then you'd be spending 100 billion a year and we'd see overall fleet carbon savings of 3.47% in the first year. If you retrofitted 4% wind assist systems for about 1.2 billion a million on, the, on all of those 40,000 ships to a total of 48 billion, you'd see overall fleet carbon savings of 3.2% in the first year, that's 4% times 40 uh, divided by 50. Um, and you get 10, if at 10% 10 wind assist savings, you get 8% overall, 15 gives you 12 and 20 gives you 16%. And all of this is delivered free of charge to point of use with no additional infrastructure. And, and we'd see huge gains in wind assist uh, efficiency with a fraction of that level of investment in R&D. So the carbon cost benefit, the overall life cycle, uh, so the carbon cost benefit analysis, the carbon bank your buck should be where you start. The overall energy life cycle, if you take into account decommissioning and maintenance, all make wind assist pretty much unbeatable. But wind assist is not even mentioned by the Global Maritime Forum, which is the getting to zero coalition. And the question is why? It's a puzzle. Next slide, please. First, they laughed. In 2018, I came to my first ever shipping conference at Shipping Insight. I was the only wind assist person here. No other, no one else knew or anything about wind assist or cared. I made a point about the technology for wind assist during an open session and someone laughed. I was on this energy panel uh, and there were five panelists and we outnumbered the audience of seven. Or we, we, only, we, we, were, we, we nearly outnumbered the audience of seven. But at the end of the conference, Angus Campbell's closing address began with carbon is the elephant in the room. In 2019, I came again as one of three wind assist people and around a quarter of the conference was about carbon. No one laughed and there were 30 people in the audience for the panel. Two real standout uh, presentations in that conference were Kersey Ticker's Collaborative Disruption one and Michael Parker's Poseidon Principles one, which were both amazing. And really it represented the 180 degree, turn 180 degree turnaround. But I could have used the same presentation this year because nothing much has actually happened. Next slide, please. So some of the technologies, there are kite sails, which are probably the earliest and maybe the best known. Um, they, they generate acceleration and huge thrust by flying a figure eight pattern, as you used to when you flew your kite as a child. Um, they have quite limited direct thrust wind angle range, uh, about 45 degree wind angle, um, but they've been used on onshore applications to drive flywheels and generate electricity. So on, there's no reason why on ships you couldn't have flywheels driven by these uh, plus, you could add solar cell cloth to them, and they'd be generating electricity like that. So they can ship share with other wind assists, and they can obviously ship share with other propulsion systems. Next slide, please. The BPLP uh, is an American cup-winning sail design, uh, which is incredibly efficient, and it delivers upwind thrust. So the wind angle uh, delivery is very, very impressive. Plus, you could add sail cloth, and so they'd be delivering electricity as well and so they can ship share with the kites. 
Uh, Flatner Motors are current market leaders. Uh, they are at the moment very big cylinders, but they're delivering 8% for Maersk on their, on their trial ship. They can also be solar coated, delivering electricity, and they can ship share with kites. They may get much smaller going forward, and there's no reason I, th I can see why they couldn't be small enough to fit around the hull, uh, as with the other uh, master devices. Next slide, please. So ship sharing and onboard energy markets, there's not going to be a single technology solution. Almost all wind assist can and will generate electricity alongside direct thrust. Collaboration with other sectors, in particular the battery sector, is going to be most important and urgent. Um, the combined technologies approaches must become a hardwired approach to industry thinking. Um, all of the, uh, the, the points made uh, by uh, John about the Poseidon principles, I recognize Poseidon principles were going to be very important and I welcome the update, but you can fit, retrofit um, uh, wind, wind assist devices to an existing ship and extend the, uh, on a Poseidon principle loan and extend the AER. Um, that is a reality and that's available now. So wind assist needs a standardized platform like mine. I happen to have one, which is a, a mounting system which can be used by multiple devices. The Apollo program didn't set out to produce the first mini computer, but it did. We have no idea what collaborative disruption can deliver, but we must get on with it. Uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eric, Alistair brings an interesting point because in theory, uh, the, the numbers are there. And we see some more applications on ferries and other ship types. Uh, but uh, in your view, uh, what, is, uh, what is happening that is uh, probably not uh, taking up as uh, expected or could help the industry? You're muted, please. Apologies, uh, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, I think there, there needs to be a change in mindset uh, in the approach of, uh, of ship owners um, looking at uh, wind, wind assist technology and, and really focusing just in on the, the element of if, if this helps us reduce our AER, um, we're moving in the right direction. It, it might not be the complete um, solution, uh, but it's partnered with other fuel technology. We've seen a lot of advancements in the last decade around um, uh, hull efficiency um, and the eco design that I think now is the time that, you know, looking at wind assist, this is a, this is a free source of energy when a ship is at sea. And I, and I think it's just been untapped because owners had a hard time looking at what's my re return on investment um, to, to, to move towards this. Um, and I, and I actually think that Poison principles do, do, do help offer a landscape that, um, a, as Alistair has mentioned, we need to have the disruptor uh, approach um, towards adapting towards this technology. Um, and uh, it, it's it, insightful for me. Um, I, I think you, you know you you have to look at the the the, the marginal gain that you, that you get and the commitment towards reducing the overall um, carbon footprint. And and this this is a landscape that probably needs to be explored more particularly in the long haul trades like VLGCs um, and uh, oil VLCC long haul and uh, mega mega container ships. Yep. Thank you, Eric. Our last speaker uh, are two, River Bennett and Alex Gilbert from Nuclear Innovation Alliance uh, who uh, talk about nuclear application. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself, Alex Will, and then we're going to kind of tag team this. So Alex and I are both coming from uh, as co-workers of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. Uh, so I'll be discussing some of our work there, but then also discussing my role uh, at ENRIC, which is a, a new Department of Energy program called the National Reactor Innovation Center. And uh, I'm Alex Gilbert. I'm coming from um, NIA, and I focus on regulatory and policy issues for advanced nuclear power. Um, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide, and we'll start this off. Um, so just to really start, when we're looking at nuclear as a source of uh, propulsion for uh, shipping, we've done this before. There are new nuclear navy navies all around the world, uh, and there have also been a number of commercial or semi-commercial applications. Uh, next slide, please. 
so historically, there are four major uh, nuclear commercial cargo ships that were sponsored by separate governments. Uh, they were originally built in the 60s uh, through the 80s. Uh, the U.S. one, the NS Savannah, has a really interesting history. It served as a uh, diplomatic ship to really spread uh, the Eisenhower message of atoms for peace. And the idea was to use nuclear energy for peaceful applications and to test it out for nuclear shipping. Now, most of these applications did not work out due to the high cost of nuclear at the time. These were largely government sponsored programs. Um, but even if you look today beyond commercial shipping, we do see other non-nuclear applications for nuclear power. Uh, and that is specifically for the icebreakers. And so Russia has a fleet of nuclear icebreakers. The US is investigating developing a new nuclear icebreaker itself. So this is something that this is an established technology uh, just in terms of using it for the shipping industry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, as we really look at what we could do in the future with nuclear power for uh, decarbonizing shipping, uh, we look at advanced nu nuclear technologies. Uh, next slide. Over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, there's been an explosion of innovation uh, in the United States and globally. Uh, and this is really a number of different companies are looking at new innovations to make nuclear power cheaper, uh, safer, and cleaner. And they're also starting to expand it into other applications such as maritime shipping. Uh, you can see the chart on the right that the amount of education that's related to nuclear engineering has been going up in recent years. And the US is really priming itself along with the rest of the world for an advanced nuclear renaissance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are some sample designs of companies that are moving ahead quickly. Uh, the two on the left, the top ones from OPA, the bottom ones from New Scale, these are companies that are either in or are, have just received uh, licensing from the NRC for terrestrial reactors. And the bottom right is actually a design from Core Power, which is looking at doing a maritime shipping nuclear reactor. And so this is something that uh, we are developing technologies that can be readily adapted to the shipping industry and is relevant for the timeframes we're looking at for 2050. Uh, next slide. Great. So we have been spending a lot of time looking at kind of the specific challenges or barriers to using this technology. Um, some research we started already doing uh, this past year, and then there's a lot more kind of collaborative work to be doing in the coming time. So I'll start uh, next slide, please, with some of our existing research. So I think one of the big questions or really the first question people have is uh, if we were to develop this technology, where can we use it? And so we've been looking at trying to examine uh, both countries that currently have nuclear navies and countries that allow access for those navies, um, as well as countries that um, have commercial terrestrial uh, nuclear power plants and trying to overlay those maps to look at, you know, develop kind of this rough sketch of uh, what type of trade routes become available and what type of regions we'd be able to, to access with this technology. The next slide. And when you break it down, um, Really, you know, the top busiest ports in the world do uh, belong in countries that provide access. Um, that's kind of might be kind of a simpler look than I mean, if you look at the top 10, for example, we have 90% of those are Chinese, the other 10% belong to Singapore, South Korea, and the United Arab Emirates. And so, again, we're just trying to look at where these these technologies already exist as kind of a, a conversation starter. Um, the top 50 busiest global seaports, um, about 35% of those have demonstrated proven access for this technology. And if you look at the whole picture, the whole globe, um, we're looking at more than a third of global container traffic goes through ports where this technology is already being used. So next slide. And I think a really important theme right here, and this, this came from Shell's recent uh, decarbonizing report called All Hands on Deck is the maritime sector is gonna have to look pretty closely at what's happening on land to make decisions out at sea. So. Uh, this is a quote from an exec in that study saying that shipping fuel will probably come from land and we need to be jointly coordinating with these other sectors. And so one really key development in the advanced nuclear sector right now is fuel availability, primarily uh, make, providing access and developing a, a supply chain for higher enriched fuels, which a lot of advanced reactors are gonna be depending on. And those deals and that supply chain is already being built out right now. We have an announcement here from last month from TerraPower, which is uh, Bill Gates is the founder of this, of this company. Uh, developing a, a fuel supply for their reactors and for the whole suite of advanced reactor concepts they're going to be uh, coming online this decade and next next slide and then there's also you know in academia there's a wide range of research taking place whether it's directly in focused on 
uh, commercial maritime nuclear propulsion or indirectly, there's a lot of implications for, for work being done right now to, to figure out what the right kind of um, commercial word that commercial, commercial intersection is. So next slide. So when we look at nuclear power, there are a few things that are unique about it compared to other energy sources. Uh, there are physical security concerns. You do have radioactive materials with a nuclear power plant uh, or a power reactor on a ship. And so that does have specific implications. Uh, it's not overly different from ships that do carry other types of hazardous materials, including nuclear fuels for sale overseas. There's also non-proliferation concerns just in terms of the materials themselves and making sure that those materials are monitored. So when we really look at these security implications, we're at an early stage, we need to understand, are these things that are deal breakers or are they something that are relatively manageable? And there is some uh, signs that it might be relatively manageable. Next slide, please. Um, but then when you go ahead and look at how the flagging system and how cabotage laws work, there are a number of different uh, issues there related to nuclear power because of those security and non-proliferation concerns you're not necessarily gonna be able to have a flag of convenience system. Most of the time you're gonna to wanna to have a national interest in developing a commercial nuclear fleet and there will have to be national policy concerns when you're doing that. And so you, um, when we're looking at how we do this in the future, can we use nuclear power? You're really gonna to have to have national level engagement on these issues. Next slide. Great, so I think really the key question here is you know, how do we get resources into this space and how do we start actually developing and demonstrating this technology? And so. I'm gonna spend some time now talking about uh, the National Reactor Innovation Center, which is doing those things exactly. So next slide, please. Right, so the National Reactor Innovation Center, it's also called NRIC, is a new DOE platform for accelerating the demonstration and deployment of advanced nuclear energy technologies. NRIC offers multiple levels of support for innovators looking to demonstrate and commercialize their products. It does this by facilitating access to the capabilities and talent housed within the US National Laboratory System. Next slide. So to give some examples of projects that Enric is gearing up for, it's really focused on cross-sector um, you know, partnerships. So for example, we're, we're prepping for work with the Department of Defense to, to develop small transportable micro reactors. We're working with uh, stakeholders in uh, space power to, to look at nuclear as repulsion tool, and then also focused on some of the current issues that nuclear has, especially its economics, which um, the majority of which are we're finding problems in the construction phase. And so figuring out what type of car targeted interventions and technologies we can develop to address those issues are another kind of key subject area for Enric. Uh, next page. So I mentioned earlier, this is just kind of for screenshot purposes, if you or we won't go into the details, but Enric offers, uh, we have the resources to do this type of work. And so we provide tiered support depending on um, how involved or, or how large your project is. The first two of which, the generic support and resource team, um, are DOE funded, which means the conversation, getting that conversation started is, is free for you all. Um, if we wanna start you know, probing this, this technology, asking, figuring out which questions to ask. Uh, and then there's also project specifics with support for much more kind of involved long-term projects. And those are you know, kind of a good um, example or, or some of the ones I provided in the last slide. So. Next slide. And then this is the one we're most excited about is that um, right now we're doing a survey and we're trying to examine what type of um, questions we need to be addressing for using advanced nuclear energy in the maritime sector. So right now, Alex and I are working together on a, a series of interviews with professionals in the maritime and nuclear spaces um, to have these conversations and get this started and, and kind of do a big gap assessment and figure out what it is we need to be addressing if we want to be serious about this. And so this is really an invitation for you all, the audience, other speakers, presenters, if you're interested in contributing to this to, to get in touch with us and, and start that conversation. We're just going to be starting out with, with hour long interviews and then uh, putting this into a report that will eventually be shared. Um, yeah, next slide. And so this is the last thing. Um, there's kind of a, a, an order of operations here, and we want to make sure that uh, we've got, you know, we can we can build these really strong partnerships between these two spaces. I think there's there's a lot to gain um, from the expertise in each one, and it depends on it's going to rely on on getting some you know resources and, and leadership up front. And so, again, 
Enric uh, at Idaho National Laboratory, which I just talked about, is going to be a huge resource. And uh, we have a lot of people who are excited about doing this. So if you are interested in getting involved, if you're interested in working uh, with us on this, um, we invite you to reach out so that we can uh, kind of inform our work on this better. Next slide. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we uh, look forward to the conversation. And please do reach out if you're interested. Thank you. Eric, uh, unfortunately, we are way beyond our uh, allocated time, but very interesting uh, the discussions and conversations. So I would like to challenge you uh, to summarize on, on uh, the Nuclear Innovation Alliance invitation and, and also to summarize uh, your views on uh, everything that was said today, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Sergio. Um, uh, gentlemen, thank you, all of you, for uh, uh, putting together these presentations today. Very informative, uh, good education uh, in the deep dive session. Um, uh, I'll just summarize on, on nuclear. I, you know, it's, um, as, you, as you pointed out, it's, it's technology that's been proven uh, at sea, actually. And, and we see that in force, you know, in the projection of force within uh, navies around the world. Um, I, I think you know the biggest challenge is 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 as you rightly put, it's the cost. And um, in the freight market, I think um, the, the the barrier to overcome is um, we need to have stability in a market um, that defines a really uh, stable runway for that investment. Um, you know, just it, looking looking at our freight markets in the oil oil segment today. Um, we're, we're seeing a freight downturn right now um, that, that wasn't expected before the pandemic. Uh, actually, 2021, uh, we're expected to be very, very uh, healthy years in the tanker market. Um, and, and that whole cycle is thrown off because uh, erosion of demand. Um, so it's, I, that to me is going to be the biggest challenge um, to, to get the ship owner behind it. I do agree with you. I think uh, with a coalition where you've got either flag or government support to drive it, um, perhaps looking at those uh, commodity trades, whether they're finished product or unrefined product that take long haul uh, ton miles and, and, and leverage nuclear technology would be a very interesting space to see um, attempted to develop uh, over the next uh, decade. Um, in summary, uh, I'll just I'll just wrap up. I it, you know it, as as one would probably suspect, you know from the ship owner's view, um, it, you know we we have LNG as a resource today. We're seeing the infrastructure um, continue to develop, uh, which is very encouraging. Um, I think LNG. Uh, checks a lot of boxes um, to um, to the ship owner um, to to reduce the, um, the the carbon footprint and the Poseidon principles. Um, and as as ship owners are looking at new build, uh, I, I think that this is going to be a very um, interesting space uh, and one that's going to get a lot of attention. But I I would say that the other areas that we talked about today. Um, around hydrogen and ammonia, um, we need we need a coalition. We need partnership, uh, sharing of uh, sharing of um, knowledge and ex expertise to develop that space. Um, battery, I think, again, is is a technology that 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 we can further optimize around. And uh, I felt that the the wind presentation today has me stepping back and saying, what, what, why why aren't we as an industry trying to find out ways where particularly on these long haul ocean routes uh, around the, um, the hub traded um, commodities. Why aren't we focusing a little bit more on that? Because it's, it's free energy that does, does get an uplift. Um, uh, so thank you very much everyone for your presentation today. Sergio, thank you very much uh, for being the moderator and uh, for uh, allowing me to offer my insights. Thank you, Eric, uh, and thank you again to all of the panelists uh, for your insights and presentations. Again, uh, we are living a grand uh, challenge, uh, and the industry needs to work together uh, to overcome that. Thank you very much. I don't know. I'll uh, uh, send it back to the organizers to see if there's still any time for the poll or for questions. We are uh, way over, over, over time, but excellent discussions. Thank you very much to all, and looking forward to next week. Sergio, thank you very much for your conclusion. I encourage us, let's move forward to the poll.
Well, thank you so much for joining us here at Shipping Insight 2020 with our deep dives today. At the beginning of Star Trek, the movie, back in 1977, there was a quote, to boldly go where no man has gone before. And that's what we're doing here with Shipping Insight 2020. We're all learning new skills and new talents. So we had some technical difficulties, but I do want to reassure you that all of the presentations are going to be made available on demand. Thank you to our speakers, thank you to our sponsors, and thank you to all of you who are attending today. I want to remind you that you can stay on the platform and through the networking uh, function of the platform, you can connect with the speakers and the other delegates that were participating today as well as some that weren't. So take advantage of that. And we look forward to seeing many of you back tomorrow at 9 o'clock Eastern Time for tomorrow's deep dive presentations and then next week, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday for the conference and exhibition. Just so you know, the platform itself is open, but the exhibition booths won't be available until Monday morning at the opening of the exhibition. Thank you again for your participation today. Thank you to our sponsors, and thank you so much to all of you for participating in A Vision for the Decade.